Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of our two webinars that we'll be presenting um, as part of the Future Farmers and Carbon Farming Futures project. Um, I apologise if you're hearing any echoing. We seem to have a bit of an issue um, at the hosting end, so you'll just um, hopefully you can just bear with us on that. We have um, the majority of the attendees now logged on, so I think we'll begin. Um, just as a bit of an introduction to the project, this project has been um, run with Sefton and Associates in partnership with the Future Farmers Network um, with funding from the Australian Government. It's a real pleasure to have you all here today and it's also a pleasure to welcome our speakers, Professor David Caroli and Richard Eckhard and our Chair for the day, um, Snow Barlow. I'll hand over to Snow in a moment but um, I just want to run through um, a few housekeeping things before we begin. You'll notice that we've opted not to use cameras in this webinar. We've just found with bandwidth issues, it can cause um, delays and, and issues for you, the participants. But of course, you'll be able to see the presentation. Just so that you know, we're also recording this webinar um, and the webinar recording will be available on the Future Farmers website in a few days. Um, so if you would like the recording, please go there or send me an email and we can forward it to you. Um, the plan is to have both David and Richard present for about 20 minutes and then Snow will chair a question session at the end. Um, please feel free to send through your questions um, and you do that by typing your questions into the question field that is in the top right hand side of your control panel. You may see the screen change during the webinar, don't worry that's just us changing speakers and it will come back. Um, so really, we, I guess we're in a position to start the webinar now. Um, before I hand over to Snow though, we've got a few um, poll questions that we'd like you to quickly do. It's just four and it should only take a minute or so. Um, so we'll just launch those now and we'll go through them quite quickly. If you're able to participate in them, that would be fabulous and would help us immensely. So this question went up now, lots of voting going on, thank you. We'll just give that a little second more. Oh, lots of voting. Okay, I think we'll stop that one. And then here's the next question. Whilst you're doing that, um, if you can also just note the Twitter handle at the top of the um, slide that you're seeing now, feel free to tweet at all during the, um, the presentation and um, extend the message of what we're what the presenters will be communicating. Just waiting on this question. Oh, stumped on this one, Richard. Okay, we'll just give that one a quick second more. Okay, we'll close that one off. Second last question. Heidi, there should have been a fourth option for some of these questions. I don't know the answer. <laughs> we'll have, we're actually repeating these at the end of the presentation, David, and um, people will have another chance to, to answer them again after hearing from the both of you. Yeah, there could be more people who say, I don't know the answer at the end. <laughs> Hopefully not. So this is the last one. Last question. That's perfect. Thank you, everybody, for voting. We'll just give that one more second. Okay, we'll close that off. So thank you, everybody, very much for participating. As I just mentioned then, um, we will be repeating those at the end of the webinar, so please, if you could answer the questions at the end as well, that would be fabulous. Um, so I'll hand over to um, Snow, who is so the chair, to... and just as way of introduction, um, Snow is a professor of horticulture and viticulture at the Uni of Melbourne 
He is the leader of the National Climate Change Research Strategy for Primary Industries, convener of the Primary Industries Adaptation Research Network and chair of the Expert Advisory Panel of Department of Agriculture's Filling the Research Gap and Action on the Ground RDE programs in climate change. Very busy man. Snow is also a member of the Australian Landcare Council, the Minister's NGO Roundtable on Climate Change and Land Sector Working Group. He chairs the Victorian Endowment for Science, Knowledge and Innovation and is a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and the Australian Institute of Agricultural Science and Technology. In 2009, Snow was awarded the Australian Medal of Agricultural Sciences. Snow's research encompasses plant water use, use efficiency, viticulture and impacts of climate change on agriculture, water management and global food security. He's currently the Foundation Professor of Horticulture and Viticulture at the University of Melbourne. So I'll now just transfer um, over to, um, uh, to David's computer and I'll hand over to Snow to, um, to present, to, to introduce David. Sorry. Thank you, Heidi. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague David Caroli. David is uh, Professor David Caroli is from the University of Melbourne but is also part of the Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence for Climate System Science. Uh, David is an internationally recognised expert in climate change, climate variability, including greenhouse and climate change in the stratosphere ozone uh, depletion. Uh, David, as many of you know, uh, had a very key role in the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report. And currently, though, David uh, is a member of the board of the Climate Change Authority, which provides advice uh, to the Australian government on responding to climate change and a number of other international committees. So I'm sure David is keen to get started. So uh, with great pleasure, I introduce uh, David Caroli. Thank you very much, you very Snow. Much. Um, and, um, no, can you so just confirm you that you can see my screen? my screen? Yes, I can. Yep, yep, we can see your screen. Okay, look, okay. that's great. Right. And uh, I'm going to assume, going that, assume that, that that means that everyone else can see it as well. As well. Um, um, very happy very to be, to uh, be uh, you know, able to give a, a, quite, a quite, quite short presentation, short presentation on, on the state of climate change science, particularly. Uh, what's happened in terms of recent climate change regulations, as well as what the projections of climate change are for the future, in particular for Australia. And it's also important to understand that the beginning of this week, uh, Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO uh, released their uh, report on the state of the climate. This was the State of the Climate 2014 report. Um, in my presentation, I haven't included a reference to that because I prepared and submitted it uh, a few weeks ago. We, we will make available that uh, link to the State of the Climate 2014 report. So, you know, climate change science has obviously been a, a major topic of uh, attention. Um, here there are basically a few uh, statements from some international uh, political uh, leaders, including a statement from Ban Ki-moon that, uh, you know, climate change is the greatest threat facing humanity. And he's looking at this from a perspective of um, international development in particular the impacts of climate change on developing countries and the poor people around the world. Barack Obama uh, commenting about climate change, and this is a statement he made in his inauguration speech at the start of 2013, that the United States will respond to the threat of climate change. Um, and here he's focusing on the intergenerational aspects of climate change, that climate change is not just uh, affecting current generations but future generations as well. And in the Australian uh, context, Kevin Rudd commenting on climate change as the greatest moral, economic and social challenge of our time. And yet he made this statement just before losing the leadership of the uh, Labor Party and climate change is more a poisoned chalice in Australia because it has led to the demise of uh, at least two leaders of, op of the opposition and two prime ministers in Australia. And, and what it's important to understand is that yes, climate change is a very uh, contested 
uh, political issue, but in fact the science is a, a very complex topic, but is relatively well understood. And I'm going to try to present that uh, current science understanding and overview of the, the observational aspects of the science as well as the future projections. And what this slide shows is some of the complexity of the climate system. We all know that the dominant factor causing the warming of the climate system is the sunlight from the sun. And the dominant factor in causing variations in the climate system is just how much sunlight there is. Uh, we know that on a sunny day and in summer, it's hotter than it is in a cloudy day. But there are many other factors influencing the climate system, including the amount of clouds affecting uh, the temperature variations, uh, the land surface aspects, whether we're talking about uh, variations over the ocean, uh, changes in uh, the land cover, uh, changes in uh, the sea ice amounts, and also changes in the atmosphere, like changes in the greenhouse gases, whether they're due to natural variations or greenhouse gas emissions from uh, industrial activity or from land clearing, as well as changes in what we call particles or aerosols in the atmosphere, which are the small uh, particles either produced from volcanic emissions or particles produced from industrial activity. We've got to try to understand how these different factors are influencing the climate system, both on year-to-year -year time scales as well as on longer time scales. And I'm going to look at that in the context of uh, observational data first of all. And when we look at climate variations, this is a graph of global average near surface air temperature variations over the period from 1970 to 2012, or over the last uh, 40 years. And, and this is a graph which shows the, the large year-to-year -year variability, and superimposed on that is a series of, if you like, horizontal lines. And if you read some newspapers or listen to some commentators, they will say that actually there's been no warming for the last 15 years or so, over the period from 1998. And in fact, we don't have to worry about global warming because global warming stopped. There's been no climate change. And in fact, if you look at this graph, you can find lots of periods of a decade or so where there was you know, no warming from 1979 to 1988, or no warming from 1988 to, sorry, from 1988 to, to 2000. Um, again, periods for which there's been no warming. But there's another way of looking at the same graph which is to look at the long-term trend. It's important to understand that, yes, we know that there's a lot of variability in climate from year to year, as well as from decade to decade. But if we want to look at climate, we really look, need to look at the evidence over an extended period. And we can do that either by um, looking at the, the variations with this view. Let's look at what's happening just in the last 10 years. And yeah, it's hard to separate the natural variability. But when we look over longer term periods, like the last 40 years, yeah. or even better, if we look at longer periods. And this series of graphs now looks at the same sorts of temperature variations averaged over the surface of the Earth from multiple observational data sets. And it shows the global average temperatures from 1850 right up to 2012. And we can see, yes, pronounced year-to-year -year temperature variations, good agreement between the different observational data sets, and we can see pronounced warming over the period from around 1900 or 1910 right up to the present. When we look at the decadal averages, what's shown in the, in the lowest panel is that each of the last three decades has been warmer than the previous decade and warmer than any decade over the whole period from 1850 to the present. There has been a warming of about nine tenths of a degree over the last 100 years and substantial warming superimposed upon year to year natural variability. There's also lots of other evidence of warming in the climate system that has led to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and many climate scientists concluding that 
there is no reasonable doubt that the climate system has warmed, both from the observational data that I just showed, but lots of other independent observations, like increases in temperatures over the land and over the oceans. Independent observations of both show warming in the climate system. We can also say evidence in the ocean heat content. Warming of the ocean, not only at the surface, but in the deep ocean. And this is really important because most of the heat that gets added to the climate system doesn't go into warming up the atmosphere. It actually goes into warming up the ocean. 90% of the heat added to the climate system over the last 100 years has gone into warming up the oceans. And we get more year-to-year -year variability in the surface air temperatures, much less variability in the warming up the oceans. We can also see other indicators of warming up of the climate system. And this includes reductions in snow cover, reductions in glacier extent over land, and reduction in the area of ice. And all of those are measures of the impacts of the warming on aspects of the climate system. We can also look at completely independent measurements, now not of temperature, but measurements of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And water vapor is a very important greenhouse gas, but it responds very quickly, not to extra emissions of water vapor, but actually to the temperature of the system. The warmer the atmosphere is, the more water vapor it can hold, and there have been observed increases in water vapor in the atmosphere over the last 40 years for the period we've got good observational data, and these are due to warming of the climate system. Again, another important indicator that there is no doubt that the climate system has warmed. And lots of evidence also shows that warming when we look at temperatures in Australia. And this panel shows now not the global temperature variations, but data from the Bureau of Meteorology in the bottom panel here for temperature variations over the last 100 years, from 1910 up to the present. We see lots of year-to-year -year variability, and then from about 1950, a pronounced warming over the last 50 years of about nine-tenths or one-tenth of a degree in average temperature, averaged across the whole of Australia. And in fact, 2013 was the hottest year averaged across Australia in all of the last 100 years. But that pattern of temperature variations is not uniform across the whole of Australia. There are spatial variations. And the factors that influence these spatial variations typically include less warming along the coastline but in particular, in the northwest of Western Australia, there are, in fact, some areas that haven't warmed at all. They've cooled. Now, we know that when it's cloudy and when it's raining, the temperatures are cooler. And that's exactly what's happened in the northwest of Western Australia. These trends in temperature over the last 50 years and the region where there's reduced warming exactly matches the pattern of rainfall changes over the last 60 years. With increases in rainfall in the northwest of Western Australia, matching the region with less warming or even cooling, and drying trends in the southwest of Western Australia, in Victoria, and up the east coast of Australia, showing substantial drying over the last 60 years. So the patterns of rainfall are more varied in Australia, and they help to explain some of the patterns of temperature variations. We've talked there about temperature and a little bit about rainfall variations. Now let's look at something that we have good observational data for, and that is the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Not just from instrumental observations, but in fact from um, air bubbles trapped in ice from Antarctica. And we can use that to look at these concentrations of greenhouse gases. They were very stable for the last 1,000 years. In fact, they were very stable for the last 10 to 20,000 years. And we now see that the concentrations have rapidly increased. And the concentration of carbon dioxide is now 394 parts per million in 2012, 390 
96 or 97 parts per million in 2013, and they are at a higher level than at any time in the last 800,000 years through ice ages and interglacial periods. So something's happened to cause these increases in carbon dioxide variations, and the conclusions are that what has happened to cause these increases in long-lived greenhouse gases are primarily due to human activity. And I thought I had another slide in there, and I must have left it out to make uh, save a little bit of time. The conclusion from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that these increases in carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases is due to burning fossil fuels as well as land clearing associated with agriculture and other human activities, industrial activities like making cement. So these substantial increases in carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane are primarily due to burning fossil fuels, agriculture and industrial activity. And now if we want to look at, well, okay, we've seen that there's been changes in the climate. We've also seen that there's been increases in greenhouse gases, as well as natural variability of the climate system. Maybe we can look at what's caused these changes in the observed climate. Unfortunately, we can't run repeated experiments with the real world. We have to try to run these experiments with simulations of the climate system, and that means we have to do these simulations with uh, the um, uh, mathematical simulations of the climate, and we use complex climate models to do that. Now, we can't uh, run the simulation with the real world, but we can run lots of simulations with these complex mathematical simulations of the climate system. And I'm going to look at two different types of experiments. We're going to look at the first lot of experiments, which are simulations that show uh, the climate and how it's varied from 1900 right up to the present, just with natural variations. And that's what's shown in this bottom series um, of, of graphs, the temperature variations over the land and over the ocean with climate models that are just driven with natural variations of the climate system, with changes in sunlight from the sun and volcanoes, and they don't show the observed temperature variations, which are the black line here. Whereas if we then run exactly the same climate models, and by we I'm talking about more than 40 different modeling groups around the world running different complex mathematical models of the climate system, run the same models and now the, include the increases in greenhouse gases, we see a much better agreement of the, uh, the climate. We see that the observed simulations agree well with what's uh, going on. And I see someone's trying to talk to me. Uh, Snow, can you uh, hear me or see me okay? Hi, David. Um, if you just maximise your screen, I think it's all good still. Okay, okay. I was getting messages that it, it had disappeared, but okay, that's fine. I will uh, maximise my screen again. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Back to full screen mode, and uh, I'll uh, I'll continue. Uh, apologies for that brief inter interruption. I was uh, it appeared that I was losing stuff. Um, if these climate models do a good job of simulating the past variations of the climate, then we can also look at maybe what these climate models would simulate for future projections in climate. But to look at future climate, we also have to know what's going to happen to these factors that influence the climate. We have to understand what's going to happen to changes in greenhouse gases, uh, changes in industrial activity. And to do that, we either use a crystal ball, and we don't have one that's going to predict exactly what's going to happen to greenhouse gases, or we come up with reasonable scenarios 
of what might happen to changes in greenhouse gases. And I'm going to focus on two separate scenarios. The first scenario is changes in greenhouse gases under essentially continued business as usual industrial activity. Growth in emissions from land clearing, growth in emissions from agriculture, and particularly growth in emissions from industrial activity. And that's this, the temperature projections globally for that are shown in this red panel here. And we get four degrees or more of warming relative to 2000 levels or nearly five degrees of warming relative to pre-industrial. Recognizing that globally, uh, the climate system, or should I say governments around the world, said they wanted to limit global warming to less than two degrees above pre-industrial level. So that's what's shown in this other scenario here, global warming with rapid reductions in greenhouse gases, rapid limitations on the amount of uh, use of fossil fuels and land clearing, and this shows that it is possible under this scenario to limit global warming to less than one degree warming above 2000 levels or less than two degrees of global warming above pre-industrial levels. Now this scenario has absolutely substantial and rapid greenhouse gas emission reductions. Let's look at what that means for changes in the climate. The red side of this graph the right-hand side, sorry about that, the right-hand side shows uh, the temperature projections for temperature change at the end of this century for the high emission scenario. And on the left-hand side is shown the temperature projections for the low warming scenario. And what you see is that Land areas in the high warming scenario, including Australia, show warming which is more than four degrees above the levels in 2000 or more than five degrees warming above pre-industrial levels. This would be a very different climate system. The stippling, the dots, indicate where we have high confidence. And now let's look at the bottom panel which shows the changes in rainfall, we see that there's actually little agreement in the changes in rainfall, even in the high warming scenario, except reductions in rainfall to the south of Australia. Good agreement for increases in rainfall over the high southern oceans and Antarctica and in the high northern latitudes, but over Australia only agreement in reductions in rainfall over the southwest of Western Australia and Victoria. Lots of uncertainty elsewhere. If we look at where there is good agreement on the projected changes, virtually certain that there'll be more hot extremes and fewer cold extremes, more heat waves in associated with these increases in global temperature, and more heavy rainfall events, particularly over land masses. And the really interesting thing is that's exactly what we've seen in Australia over the last decade and a half. More hot extremes, fewer cold extremes, and more heavy rainfall events. Let's look at an example of some of the impacts of these changes. And this is a schematic or an illustration for one part of Australia, for Queensland, of the best estimates of the major areas that will be at risk or the major aspects that climate change will lead to. And let's focus on a range of things. Increases in sea level leading to major impacts, not only in the Torres Strait, which is illustrated here, but all along the Queensland coast. And in fact, sea level rise under this high warming scenario is projected to increase by one meter by the end of this century. That will lead to major impacts all around Australian coasts increases in very hot days, leading to major increases in the frequency of heat waves in days above 35 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius, having impacts on agricultural productivity all around Australia, as well as increases in deaths from uh, heat waves and hot extremes. 
reductions in rainfall and reductions in water availability, particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin and in Eastern Australia. We also have major impacts associated with um, uh, the impacts of temperature rise on the Great Barrier Reef and on tropical ecosystems, particularly the um, rainforests and natural ecosystems. So I'm going to move on and let's look at, well, okay, what do we need to do in terms of controlling climate change? And the conclusion from the latest scientific assessment that if we want to limit climate change, then we have to limit cumulative emissions of these long-lived greenhouse gases, particularly cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide. What this graph shows is that the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide over the period since pre-industrial times are directly related to global temperature change. And what this really says is that if we want to limit global warming to less than two degrees of warming, we have less than a trillion tons of emissions of carbon that can be emitted over all time from the present. Sorry, over all time, from pre-industrial time. So less than a trillion tons of carbon. If we then take into account emissions of methane and nitrous oxide, that limits this cumulative budget since pre-industrial times to 800 billion tons of carbon. Now that's an enormous amount, except we then can assess that we've already emitted more than 500 billion tons and we're limited then to 300 billion tons of carbon that can be emitted by all the global population over time. 300 billion is a really large number, except we have 7 billion people. And what that means is we've got less than 50 tons of carbon that can be emitted per person over all time from the present. 50 tons of carbon and average emissions of carbon per person in Australia are around 7 tons of carbon. So we use up our budget on average in Australia in seven years at current rates of emission. Well, let's look at what the Climate Change Authority recommended in terms of emission reduction budgets. It used this budget approach. It looked at the trajectories. It looked, what's shown in this graph is Australian emissions, 600 um, tons, sorry, 600 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions per person, that, sorry, in total. So 600 million tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions roughly every year. When we divide that by the population, we end up with about 27 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per person. What is shown here is what we need to do, or what are the options in a series of trajectories of emissions. The government and the opposition have agreed to reduce emissions by 5%, but the recent Climate Change Authority assessment said that that is not enough for Australia's to provide a fair and equitable share. And if we only have a 5% emission reduction, we've then got to have dramatically faster emission reductions if we stay within Australia's budget. In fact, we, in all these scenarios, we use up, we have to go down to zero emissions in Australia in the next 20 to 30 years. So this comes up with a range of scenarios and under all of these scenarios, except something that has really dramatic emissions, we have to reduce Australia's emissions essentially to zero in the next 30 to 40 years. So let me sum up. Climate science has a, continued to assess the observational evidence. There are uncertainties, but 
we're already seeing the impacts of a changing climate. There is no doubt that the climate system is changing and the major cause of this change over the last 50 years has been human-caused increases in greenhouse gases. The changing climate has impacts already that we're seeing, impacts on health, on agriculture, and on natural ecosystems. There has been progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but if we're to stabilize climate this century at this globally agreed target of less than two degrees, then we need to dramatically reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. I hand back to um, Emily and uh, Heidi now, but what we can see here is that the political action is probably not fast enough to achieve yet the global emission reductions that are needed. Thank you. Okay, thanks Thanks so much for that, David. Um, I will now unceremoniously mute you so that we can stay on control on top of this um, echoing issue. So thank you so much, and we will unmute you as questions come through. If you can just leave your screen there for one second, and I'll transfer over to Richard and Snow. Um, my apologies again, everybody, for um, the echoing. Thanks so much to Kiri Broad for helping us figure that out. Thanks to Kiri Broad for helping us figure that out. Oh, and we've now got... Um, oh, Echoing again, I'll just again, I'll um, mute Snow and Richard for a second. I will unmute them, but please um, send through your questions. We haven't received any questions yet, so please do that so that we can um, have a bit of interaction at the end of the presentation. So I'll now mute myself and hand over to Richard and Snow. Unmuted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Uh, I'll uh, quickly introduce um, Richard Eckhart. Uh, Associate Professor Richard Eckhart is Director of the uh, Primary Industry Climate Challenges Centre, a, a joint initiative uh, of the University of Melbourne and the Victorian Department of Environment and Primary Industries these days. Um, Richard uh, researches um, in the and leads program in the area of enteric methane, nitrous oxide and whole farm systems modelling for both mitigation and adaptation and uh, he uh, works a lot internationally and sits on a number of international science advisory uh, committees in this area uh, for Australia and New Zealand but also the UK governments and the United Nations FAO. So Richard Eckhart. Great. Thank you so and um, hello to everybody out there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking to you for the next 20 minutes about uh, carbon farming in Australia and um, we'll just run through uh, the background, um, how, we, how we arrived at where we are and um, what the current situation is with uh, opportunities for, for agriculture. So uh, to start off, um, just the context is that um, uh, what you're seeing on this graph here is the annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory for Australia. Now, um, uh, every, every country uh, develops this inventory and submits it to the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, in this particular case, this is the profile for, um, uh, well, it was published in 2013, but it would be the 2011 year. And you can see the majority of greenhouse gas emissions, no surprises, they come from the energy sector. So that red bar on the left of 59%, would largely represent the coal-fired power stations in Australia. Then the second bar would represent road transport, um, cars, trucks, um, but you can see agriculture there at 14.9%. So it's important just to break that down a little bit. So what I'll do over the next few slides is just break down that, that agricultural bar into its components. And this pie chart shows you what that, uh, what that proportion of agriculture is made up of. So you can see it's predominantly enteric fermentation. So that is methane produced by the digestion processes in the stomach of, of ruminants, cattle and sheep mainly. Um, and the majority of methane in Australia would come from both from agriculture but from enteric methane. So it would make up just around almost 12% of national emissions. The rest of the graph there is made up of various other sources. The second biggest one of which is agricultural soils, that yellow section on the left. 18% uh, 
that's mainly nitrous oxide and that is from any form of nitrogen that we have cycling either through fertilizers or through animal waste um, in our agricultural systems. Um, again, nitrous oxide is the dominant source um, of our agriculture is the dominant source of nitrous oxide. If we then break it down again and we say, well, how does that look? What does that profile look like for different production systems across Australia? You can see uh, a comparison of, say, dairy, beef, and grains. Now, um, uh, obviously, the difference between dairy and beef would largely be in the amount of nitrogen fertilizer used in dairy, which doesn't exist, obviously, in the beef area. So you'd have this nitrous oxide grouping of, uh, of sources in the dairy, and obviously it's a lot less in the beef, mainly methane. However, if we then compare that to a grain system, first thing to notice, notice is, the, is the lower emissions from a grain system, for example, in terms of tons of grain or in terms of tons per hectare compared to the livestock systems. And that's obviously, there's a large component of enteric methane that is not being emitted from the grain systems. Um, taking that further then and, and splitting it out to say, well, where are they, where are the different sources? You can see, and this is largely a function of animal numbers, it's no surprises. The largest number of animals we have is in the beef sector, and so you'd expect, well, if methane is just a, a function of the number of animals we've got, well, that makes sense that beef would be the largest, sheep would be the second largest, and then dairy after that. The red bars here are the amount of, um, of emissions of methane that come from manure storage or manure management systems. So obviously in beef it's really only feedlots that are producing anything there, whereas in the, um, uh, in the dairy sector we do have some, and obviously in swine and poultry there'd be some, but relatively quite small. If you look at the nitrous oxide profile, um, where it comes from, a large amount from, from use of fertilizers, but even more so from grazing, because ruminants excrete a lot of nitrogen, um, both in their dung but mainly in urine. These next two bars here um, the, uh, was what we call the indirect emissions, uh, and that's assuming that a large amount of ammonia is lost from our fertilizer use and from animal urine, and some of that ammonia comes back down to earth, enters the soil, and becomes nitrous oxide as well. Same for nitrate leaching. So we lose nitrogen out of our agricultural systems, and um, whatever the nitrate drains through the soil, then heads out into a wetland system somewhere, and some of that can become nitrous oxide. So that's the main, the main sources that we see. Just moving on to, on to methane and why it's a problem. Um, in the first place, uh, methane is a higher global warming potential. So what that means is that relative to releasing one mole of um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, one mole of methane in the atmosphere warms the atmosphere by 25 times more than that of of uh, carbon dioxide. So it's a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But it also has a, a fairly short-lived time in the atmosphere, so about 8 to 12 years before it's, it's fully um, broken down in the atmosphere. Um, and that's also important in, in terms of uh, reducing its impact. And we can see that atmospheric concentrations have changed. The graph on the top right, but also the figures down below show us that there's been a, dis a, a definite increase in the methane uh, in the atmosphere since, uh, uh, since more recent developments, since the Industrial Revolution, really. Nitrous oxide, a very similar situation and even more uh, a straight line because um, really it's the, uh, it, the expansion of, of agriculture that resulted in a lot more nitrogen fertilizer being used um, that uh, leads to one of the main sources um, in the atmosphere. So it's almost 300 times more powerful in global warming than carbon dioxide. However, the actual amounts of nitrous oxide that come out of our agricultural systems is quite modest. Um, so in terms of a, um, an, a, an agronomic effect or an economic effect, it's not big. But in terms of the atmosphere, it is quite big. And again, you can see that um, the concentrations have increased in the atmosphere. So I thought it important just to run through the carbon cycle, uh, this can be an either a cropping or a grazing system, but the example I've used is a grazing system. But it's important just to understand how carbon is fluxing through our, 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 our livestock and um, our cropping systems. And here we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the top, and that carbon dioxide is captured by plants through the process of photosynthesis. So 
Um, the very fact that we have a physical plant growing there says that some of the carbon is now gone in pho through photosynthesis and is captured in carbohydrates, that's the plant sugars, um, that result in a plant. Now, there's some of that carbon dioxide is released when plants respire, some of it goes back, but there's a net flow of carbon into the plant during photosynthesis and we end up with a plant. Now, some of that plant uh, decays and we have these residues that land on the soil surface. We have some of it becoming different particles of soil carbon in the soil, um, some, some of them being in sort of rapid turnover carbon in the soil and others in smaller fractions of slow turnover carbon in the soil. But this is really how the system works because the, the role of these residues then is to, is to maintain a pool of soil carbon in the soil um, that represents the decay of plant material and the microbes then actively work on this and their job is to turn that over and to mineralize the carbon back to the atmosphere um, and in doing so to release the stored nutrients in that soil carbon back to the system. So for example most of the nitrogen that goes to grow our crops and our pastures comes out of the turnover of that pool of soil carbon. So there you have a complete cycle sending CO2 back to the atmosphere and once this plant fully degrades, it goes back to the atmosphere. Now, the, the, the trick is that, that in a stable system, that is a carbon neutral system. So the carbon going in balances the carbon going out in any stable agricultural system. The fluctuations in that are really around environmental conditions. Now, the flaw in the system comes where we then introduce an animal. Because what that animal does is it takes some of that carbon that was carbohydrate it then eats it and it fundamentally and chemically converts it into a different form. So it's no longer CO2, it's CH4, which is methane. So it's still got carbon in it, but it's in a methane form and that chemically warms the atmosphere 25 times more than carbon dioxide does. That's where the system kicks out of balance um, in, its, in, in, in a carbon balance sense. Um, and then obviously there's also nitrous oxide being produced by the animal eating protein and excreting nitrogen, um, some of which goes to nitrous oxide. But you can see though that in a stable system, without the ruminant, photosynthesis should largely equal respiration plus mineralization. So the amount going in is balanced with the amount going out and the fluctuations are really around how much rainfall is, is in the system. Where we then, um, it, include the ruminant and we've got respiration plus mineralization plus methane as a, an end point, the balance is no longer there and that's why um, the, uh, the methane is a priority concern for research. So where are we at with the, uh, the Australian policy context? Um, we know that um, we had an emissions trading uh, scheme uh, in, the, in the previous government but the current government is looking at a direct action policy. And what that means is that um, they will uh, create a fund called the Emission Reduction Fund, which is now currently going through both the green and white paper process. And using money in that fund, which is largely uh, government revenue, um, they will offer a reverse auction. Now, a reverse auction is, is simply having um, one buyer and multiple sellers. So you've got multiple sellers in that various entities across the economy being a power station or being a, a agricultural operation, they believe they have valid reductions in emissions and they can offer them to government to sell. And then the government chooses how they want to buy those, buying up the cost curve. Um, and um, so uh, government then uses the emission reduction fund, which is basically 300 million in the year one, 500 in year two, and 750 million in year three to buy the lowest cost they can um, of, those, um, of those emission reductions. What that means is that any agricultural um, emissions reductions would, would then have to compete with other sectors uh, to, to, uh, for sale. There is, important, importantly, there was bipartisan support for the Carbon Farming Initiative and in particular the current government aims to expand the scope of the Carbon Farming Initiative. So uh, that's what's really changed from the previous government to the current government is um, that the previous government, there were multiple buyers under an emissions trading scheme, whereas under the uh, reverse auction, there is one buyer being government that uh, is looking to buy offsets. So the carbon farming initiative is a incentive-based mechanism 
where landholders can receive carbon credits for any real reductions they can make in methane and nitrous oxide um, for, uh, or for increasing carbon that's either stored in soils or in vegetation through trees in particular. Um, the key is that participation is voluntary. So this is not something that is, legis that is uh, uh, um, essential. Uh, it is something that's purely voluntary to get involved in. And uh, those in the, under the Carbon Farming Initiative that have offsets to sell can then trade it under reverse auction, competing with all other sectors in a open uh, reverse auction uh, front to government. Obviously, there is the option to also sell um, carbon onto voluntary markets. And there are lots of these voluntary markets around the world. Um, the price in voluntary markets that you would get is 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 marginal. Um, it's a lot lower than um, in some of the uh, the more um, regulated markets. Now, just two things on how the CFI is then managed. Um, and uh, this is the two points I've got up here: is the management before the trade and the management after the trade. So you could imagine the Domestic Offsets Integrity Commission. That's the DOI. They're responsible for making sure that the system has integrity. So they assess what proposals are going up and make recommendations to the minister and make sure that the system is actually rigorous. Um, the clean energy regulator then is, sits on the opposite end of the, the buying spectrum. So once the trading is, is, um, is uh, about to happen, they approve the projects that go up to specifically trade and they are the ones that determine whether the credit should be allocated or not. Um, so that's just a bit of how the system works. The positive and negative list you can think as the uh, as the the good list and the naughty list. Um, so the good list says what are the things that um, they say in principle we would like to recognise these as um, as actions that can be uh, accredited under the CFI, and the negative list is anything we want to try and avoid having perverse outcomes like. Um, uh, reduced water use, uh, a negative biodiversity outcome, um, reducing employment, um, things like that. So um, uh, it's just a it's just a, a list to try and guide future development of of methodologies to say, well, if it's on the positive list, then it's already been identified as being something that um, will not have a negative impact and is not already common practice or not required by legislation. Then there's the integrity standards, and that's just a way of making sure the system stacks up internationally against a, uh, an international set of standards that say it goes beyond current practice. It wasn't going to happen in regardless. Um, if there's carbon storage, it's permanent. It's not uh, a transient. It's not there today, gone tomorrow. Um, but under the uh, current government, they're looking at changing the 100-year rule, so permanence being 100 years under the previous um, arrangement being more around 25 years to try and get landholders more engaged in uh, the time scale. Avoidance of leakage says, well, you can't actually destock on one property and double stocking rate on the next one just to compensate because that actually doesn't help the atmosphere. It has to be based on, based on rigorous science, has to be measurable, um, conservative so that we're not actually claiming the 100% of what's, what's potential just in case um, uh, the measurements are not, are not as good as they could be. And international consistency will allow us to get recognition internationally for these in some future environment. This gives you a sense of um, what methods have actually got up already. So these are um, the two columns I have here on the right is the number of projects in each one of these areas and the amount of carbon credits that have already been issued. Now, I guess what straight away most of you would see is when you're looking at this list, you would see that the major beneficiaries so far of the Carbon Farm Initiative have been town councils. Um, and what I mean by that is you could look at this and say, well, this is all um, urban waste management systems. So um, most of these 62 projects are associated with regional councils, towns, cities that are managing their, their landfill gas waste. Um, while at the same time, you know, um, it's it's not directly agricultural and it's a carbon farming initiative, um, you probably can appreciate that we've known the science around landfill gas for a long time. It's well established science, so it shouldn't surprise us that that's where the major activity started off. Um, 
Also, the second major beneficiary of the CFI to date has been more in the forestry sector because, again, we've, we've known the science of carbon storage in trees for quite a long time. So when the policy was, was available, those are where the projects were available. Then in the agricultural area, uh, again, it probably shouldn't surprise us, we've, we've known the methane production from piggery waste and from biodigesters. And so, again, uh, that's probably where the first action would have taken place because the science was well understood. Where we are still trying to develop the science is more in the broadac agriculture area. What can we do about um, methane from livestock and what can we do about nitrogen fertilizers? And that's where we've got a way to go still in the, in the research. We have got one method through, feeding dietary oils and dairy cattle. It's some research that we started about eight years ago and that really has been one of the first cabs off the rank in the broadacre agriculture sector. So that gives you a snapshot of where the action is taking place in the CFI. And if we had to be honest right now, a lot of the broadacre agricultural options are still very much in the research phase yet to come through, but they, they will come through at some stage. So in response to that, what government has done is invested a significant money in various national research programs. And so we've seen the Climate Change Research Program invest in a soil carbon program, a, uh, a livestock methane program, a nitrous oxide program, and a biochar program. Um, and then in the next round, the Carbon Farming Futures, filling the research gap pro pro projects, which are still running at the moment, run to 2015. Uh, again, more research on soil carbon um, and livestock methane, nitrous oxide, this time including a manure management program and a modeling program. And the modeling program is really important because what it's doing is it's taking all the research from the components and putting it into a, a whole farm system and saying, well, what does this look like in terms of the profitability back to the farmer of these various options? Um, and that will be the real test at the end of the day is coming up with cost effective options that reduce emissions but do not affect or have a, still have a positive impact on agricultural production. And that remains the challenge that we face. So one of the ways to look at this is that um, we've, uh, uh, we, should, we should think of, of, of this on a, on a timeline where um, we've got the mitigation of methane on the left here. And right now we know that there's certain best management practices, herd management and supplements we can feed animals. They'll reduce methane. Um, but the impact is fairly modest. You can see it's fairly low, low impact. We know we can do it right away because that technology is available and we have high confidence that it will actually achieve that. But as you go up the spectrum and you get to vaccinating cattle or breeding animals with low methane, we're probably still 15 to 20 years out in research. So the likely impact is bigger. We're 20 years out in research, so our confidence is lower. And then you get up to the top right hand corner and our confidence is a lot lower, but the impact is potentially higher. So we need to be committed to a range of research in this area so that we can come up with cost effective options over time. Also, the same can be said for nitrous oxide, um, where you can see the same effect. There's best management practices, things we know we can do now. Um, they don't have a big impact, but things we should be able to do in the future. So I'll leave that with you to, to think about. So just to finish off with what things we know we can do now. Um, there's options for the abatement of uh, methane. And um, uh, clearly there's things we can do about improving the diet quality of, of uh, what we feed animals, supplements we can feed them that do reduce methane itself. Um, there's things we can do definitely. A lot of the modeling we're doing is showing that there's great efficiencies to be had by just improving weaning rates, um, improving branding rates, uh, just managing animal numbers and reducing the number of unproductive animals we have in our livestock systems. And then in medium term, some animal and plant breeding options we have, and longer term microbial manipulation. In terms of nitrous oxide, there's obviously the best management practices around nitrogen fertilizer, the rate, source, timing, placement of nitrogen that makes a big difference to the efficiency of nitrogen. And a lot of research around um, formulations of nitrogen being inhibitors or slow release fertilizers. Um, the only issue around these inhibitors and flow release fertilizers is at this, this stage they have a price premium and not quite as cost effective. 
there's things we can do around soil and water management, managing compaction in soils, managing irrigation and drainage. And obviously animal management because urine is a major source of, of, of nitrogen being lost. And so things like balancing the protein to energy ratio in diets fed to animals will address the amount of excess nitrogen being lost. And then medium to long term plant breeding and microbial manipulation. This is a list of some of the offsets that we're busy working on at the moment. Dietary oils, uh, a nitrogen fertilizer methodology which should come through this year. Options for the northern grazing industries around feeding nitrates instead of urea licks. That nitrates can reduce methane whereas the urea won't. Um, and that might be a simple displacement of a urea lick with a nitrate lick. And then by the middle of this year we should see a methodology for soil carbon come through. Just to finish off then, there's a number of tools for those who are interested. There's a link here to a page that has a whole range of different accounting tools. If you're interested, um, the, the screen you see there is, uh, is an example of, a, um, of, a, of a, an output. You'll get a pie chart for either a dairy system, a sheep, beef, a feedlot, or a grain system. Simple spreadsheet take you about five minutes to fill out and to get a profile of a particular farm. If you wanted more detail, tools that go into a lot more detail. There's a list on this page here. They're all at that same web, web link I showed you at the bottom at the, the tool site and you can access any of those tools for your own interest. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks so much for that. Richard, I'm just going to mute you for one second, but you should, can you confirm that you've received two questions? Snow or Richard? Yeah, we're just expanding it now so we can see. Um, I think we can. Okay, well, I'll hand over to you then. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the first question is, uh, is one uh, uh, for David uh, and uh, it's for Tom, uh, Tom Tooley uh, and the question is atmospheric decomposition is it the same as plant oxidation? David uh, Snow can you say that again was it atmospheric decomposition? Uh, atmospheric decomposition, presumably of greenhouse gases, David, uh, is that the same as plant oxidation? Uh, I don't actually know what the person is talking about. So the let me just provide a general answer. The, the composition of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, is obviously measured, but in particular the sources of and the main yeah, sources of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere includes um, oxidation of vegetation and uh, uh, decomposition of uh, plant material. Uh, so that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But the major source of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is in fact natural emissions from the ocean as well as natural plant decomposition of vegetation. So these release of carbon dioxide from plant decomposition and release of carbon dioxide from carbon dioxide dissolved in ocean waters are the major natural sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and they are in fact much larger, about 30 times larger than the human emissions of or industrial emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. But there is, has not been anything that is able to naturally remove these extra human emissions of carbon dioxide. Thanks, David. Uh, Tom, if, you're, uh, if that's not quite what you wanted, maybe buzz us another question. There was a second question from uh, Joshua, and, and that is, uh, is the eight to 12 year breakdown instant or is there a half-life for methane uh, and presumably that's for you David. Uh, yeah look it could be me or it could be Richard. Um, it is not a, uh, it is a slow uh, decomposition process uh, 
uh, associated with multiple different factors, primarily the oxidation of methane uh, from methane into carbon dioxide and other products, uh, and it happens effectively with a half-life of uh, slightly less than 8 to 12 years, but so that the, the actual lifetime or the removal time is about 8 to 12 years. But it is not an instantaneous removal uh, um, that, that basically it stays there for 8 to 12 years and then he's gone. No, it is a progressive removal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, a question from Tamara, uh, and I think uh, the rest of the webinar would probably like to hear this answered, uh, and it's probably for Rich. Uh, and that is, how far away uh, are broad acre uh, uh, options you know, for mitigation? Uh, given the previous presenter said we needed to, Jim and David uh, needed to say we needed to achieve zero uh, emissions in the next 20 to 30 years, Will we see this science develop with the time to implement, implement and reach this? So, firstly, to Rich about you know where what's the time frame from broadacre emissions which cover an enormous amount of Australian agriculture, and then second, I wanted to ask you that anyway, David, was you know is it possible to achieve zero emissions? But firstly, Rich. Okay. Thanks, Lo, and uh, thanks, Tamara. Um, yeah, look, uh, the, 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 the issue fundamentally what we've, what we've got here is research usually takes at least about 10 to 12, maybe sometimes 15 years from concept to some level of adoption in the agricultural industries. Um, so that's, that's a fairly long lead time we have anyway. Um, and some of the larger options, the larger, more cost effective options of of controlling, say, livestock emissions or broad acre nitrous oxide emissions, um, some of those really sort of big, big hitting, sustainable, long term options are still probably 10 to 15 years out in research before they come through. So there'll be, there'll be. You remember that graph that I showed earlier? There'll be modest gains along the way, but the really big options to have, a, say, a 50% reduction in methane from livestock in Australia. Um, we're still talking about 15 years out in research before the options are available and then another adoption process after that. So yes, uh, last, uh, you know, agriculture will make its contribution over time, but I suspect that also given the, de the increasing demand for food production globally, I suspect we will actually see a, an emissions intensity improvement in agriculture, but I'll see, I, I, I would say we would see a net increase in total emissions from agriculture simply because you can't feed a planet of 9.5 billion people in 2050 with less food than we do now. And um, as we increase food production, the proportion of emissions do go up anyway. So yes, we'll have mitigation, but I suspect the total from agriculture will go up, not down. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, perhaps, David, uh, to sort of rephrase the question to you around that uh, with your Climate Change Authority hat on. How do you see those options? Are the real options to get to zero emissions, say, in 30 years? Or do you see it's perhaps a better pathway to do more early because the last bit to get to uh, zero emissions might be pretty tough? Um, so that's, that's, that's obviously the $64 trillion question um, because much of the current world economy is based on using fossil fuels and, and uh, having relatively high emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, so, but fortunately, there are a range of options. It's also important to understand that when we're talking about uh, zero emissions, we're talking about zero net emissions. And we can have continued emissions from agriculture. And I agree with Richard that it is very important to continue to feed the world's population. Uh, we need to take into account the important uh, sources of emissions associated with agriculture, but there may be and there are ways that uh, uh, increased uptake of uh, greenhouse gases uh, through appropriate um, emissions capture technologies, including carbon capture and storage at industrial plants, 
as well as increases in uh, reforestation, which probably only has a small component that will lead to uh, increases in, in carbon capture, but it's an important component, as well as potential for industrial scale marine algal farms using uh, marine and, and saline ponds to grow algae and skim it off and capture it will potentially lead to significant um, uptake or capture of carbon dioxide, as well as dramatic improvements in energy efficiency and switching from fossil fuel driven energy sources to low and zero carbon dioxide uh, energy sources, including uh, wind farms, uh, solar uh, PV, uh, solar hot water, and many other uh, renewable energy sources. So zero carbon is possible, allowing people to eat as well as capturing the carbon dioxide, but it requires massive research and a major cultural and social change. Okay. I think back to you, Heidi. Yeah. Okay. I will just um, okay for a second. Okay. So um, I guess I'd just like to. We'll have to wrap up now. Thank you to everybody for staying on a bit longer than the scheduled hour. But I think that you'll agree that it was worthwhile. Um, I'd like to thank Professor David Caroli, Associate Professor Richard Eckhart, and Professor Snow Barlow very much for their time. If anybody has any questions um, after this, please just email myself or Emily Bowman on the registration emails that you got and we'll do our best to, to answer those questions. Again, thank you for your time and don't forget to fill in the poll at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. I'm muted. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.